Well, good morning, folks. You're coming with me for another day in my life in the hospital. I get to show you some cool aspects of how we've adapted care in the era of COVID-19. I'm going to shower, I promise. Thank you. It was a very crazy start to the morning. I was woken up several times throughout the night by news agencies reaching out, asking if I'm able to do television this morning. I'm actually going into the office, so I won't be able to do media. Today is an outpatient family medicine day. TGIF. Donna, are you ready? I am ready. What are we doing? We're giving you your flu shot. Why? To keep you healthy. Are you going to be really rough with the needle? Yeah. I'm going to be so gentle. I think I might jab you a little. She's going to jab okay? me. But that's because you know, I misbehave a lot. <laughs> this is the flu shot. We're going to close the door because it's yes, getting serious. Are. Be rough with me. Let's go. Hold up. As hard as you oh, need to. It's stretchy. It's I want you to relax. I'm relaxed. One, two, three. Huge. Perfect. That was really good. That was you smooth. You did not even move. That was smooth. While we're sitting here, I have my bone pen. <laughs> but in all seriousness, everyone at home, please get your flu shot. We really need it now more than ever. It's COVID-19 season, and while this flu shot does not prevent you from getting COVID-19, it does prevent you from getting a virus, which may look like COVID-19, which will lead to a ton of confusion. On top of that, with hospitals being busy handling COVID-19 patients, we don't want you to get sick with the flu and then have to come into the hospital for care. It's funny, I'm actually in an exam room right now, but as you can tell, there's no patient here. But there is a computer. And this computer has a webcam and a microphone all set up for virtual patient visits, which we've been doing a lot of. In fact, telemedicine has absolutely blown up during the COVID-19 pandemic, and rightfully so. A lot of things you can take care of by a virtual visit. Having a conversation about medications, perhaps looking at some rashes. There's all sorts of guidance that we can give through a virtual visit. That being said, a virtual visit does not replace a visit face-to-face -face with your doctor. There's all sorts of benefits to seeing a doctor in person, including getting an accurate physical exam, reading body cues, having a better doctor-patient connection. The physical exam is probably the most important, though. It's you. Yeah. You know what time it is? What time is it? <laughs> it's lunchtime. I'm treating today. We're chilling with a favorite Dr. Mike here. What do you want to eat? You, you always tell me I don't order enough food. Where's the bowl of pizza you normally order? Team, what are we eating? Sandwiches place down on Main Street. Okay, sandwiches? Yeah. Hey, Greg, any votes? Uh, not really. Tell me how COVID has affected your life. Mm, it has affected me, I would say personally. Okay. And um, emotionally. At the end of it, if we work really hard to stay safe and follow guidelines, we'll be better off in the long run. And that's something that gets me by. I want to show you guys real quick some COVID-related changes in the office. This is our waiting area. Social distancing is important. We're also not having patients wait here. They actually call us from the parking lot, let us know that they're here. We get them checked in, meet them right by the door, do a temperature check, ask a few questions, bring them in following a one-way path. Patients can only walk through this hallway, exit through there, Enter through there. This is cool. I like pointing like this. Stacey, why are you laughing? Just stop laughing at me for one second. Vivian, how do you feel about 5 million people seeing you? It's a very trying experience. <laughs> so I just had a really interesting patient encounter with a young gentleman who was complaining of uh, easy bruising. And actually bruising that happened over the last weekend without any trauma or any inciting incident. And in these conditions, a lot of people start going to clotting issues, platelet dysfunction, even cancer sometimes. What's interesting with this patient, all those things have already been ruled out because they were seen by a hematologist who is a blood specialist. This is a second second time they're being evaluated for this, approximately a year later. And right away, my mind jumped to something that was actually learned in medical school. And that's Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which is a connective tissue disorder that causes hypermobile joints, skin issues, like easy bruising. So I asked the patient if he has any hypermobility. And he said, oh yeah, I consider myself double jointed. He's able to bring his thumb all the way to his wrist. The skin is very elastic, very loose. So now we're beginning the, the evaluation to see if he has EDS. But unless we think outside of the box when a patient comes in, you can miss a diagnosis like EDS. That's why it's important to get a thorough, thorough history each time you talk to a patient. I swear, sometimes like you think people are doing work. You think they're doing work, but instead, here's what they're doing. Here's what 
what they're doing. What is that? That's not work. <laughs> You're looking at dog pictures. What are you? Oh, abuse. Call HR. That's my breaking news. They put you in a tutu. That is my tutu. I did that for breast cancer. And it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So folks, if you're of age, get screened, talk to your doctor about it. Today was sort of a short day. It's only about five, six o'clock. I thought I'd decide to drive over to the main hospital and show you what we're doing here in terms of preparing for a potential second wave of COVID. Yo, look who I run into. Who is that? Who is this? Who is this? Okay. Now this, ladies and gentlemen, is a sign I can get behind. The stairs of the hospital. This is where we got all our exercise in when we were residents. This is where I would sprint up and down when there was a code blue. You know, chest compression, chest compression, chest compression. All right, we're officially on the floor that can be used if there is a need for overflow of ICU patients specifically made to battle COVID-19. A lot of people have been wondering what are hospitals doing to prepare if there is a second wave of COVID-19? Well, this is what we're doing. There's technological advancements that I'm gonna show you throughout this unit that is a prime example of collaboration between the nursing staff, the healthcare staff, engineering staff, which you may not think is part of the healthcare team, but they're a vital part of the healthcare team. Engineering basically made these eight bed pods for mm -hmm. us and they gave us a monitor system so we can look inside all the rooms so uh -huh. we don't have to go in the room. And also they gave us these monitors so that we can adjust the physiologic monitors in the room so we don't have to go in. The other thing they did is um, during COVID, when nurses needed something, they had to bang on the door to uh. get someone's attention and scream to the door saying, I need this. So intercom system. Wow. Okay. So all the rooms have intercom systems. On the med surge units, the uh, doors had little slits for windows. Yep. Um, so here they made the windows much bigger, easy visibility, and we don't have to peer through a little slit. The other thing is outlets. Oh yeah, something that we take for granted. We don't even think about them. Outlets on the wall in the hallway. Why, why should they be in the hallway? because that's where all the equipment is. Right, so you don't want to have it inside the patient's room because then if you need to change it, that's a waste of PPE, yes. that's a potential exposure. The other great thing that engineering did, listen to us, is they built these little holes in the wall. What that does is we feed our IV tubing through it. Each of the rooms is outfitted in what we call a scrubber, so it can make any room into negative pressure. Look at that. All these patients had to be in negative pressure rooms. Exactly. So for those of you who don't know what negative pressure room is, it basically sucks the air into the room, keeps the air into the room, so that infection doesn't potentially seek out into the environment, getting others sick, which protects other patients and nursing staff, doctors, CMAs, everyone who's around. So how many total beds are available on this floor? So there's going to be a total of 32. 32 beds. beds. Mm -hmm. And they're available, ready to use already if we need them. Correct. So we're prepared for the surge. We're ready to help people out. And these can be full on ICUs? They can be full on ICUs. Wow, okay, so we're ready. Is there like a central nursing station? Can we see that? We have a large uh, monitoring screen here, the cameras that we can look at all the rooms right here. And then our central monitoring station is right here. And then you have oxygen meters, medical air, the vacuums, everything is set up so it could be done right here without necessarily entering the patient's room. Correct. Hopefully we won't need to use this unit much, but if the situation arises, we can absolutely know that we're gonna be taken care of, our patients are gonna be taken care of, our staff is gonna be safe. Do you have any parting words for our YouTube audience here? No, just, um, you know, don't delay care. If you're sick, come to the hospital. We are a safe place to be. We have many lessons that we learned that we've put into place already, and we're here for you. Healthcare hero right here. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. You guys got the full tour, the COVID wing. I am on my way home, not to relax, but to do some notes. Every job has its pros and cons. Writing long notes, cons of this job, but the pros most definitely outweigh it. I'd never trade my career for anything else.